Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Singapore and for a series of live interviews with some incredible people from across Singapore's health, fitness, sports and wellness marketplace. I'm joined today by none other than Tech Yin Lim, CEO for Sport Singapore, a statutory body in Singapore that looks after all of the sporting activities, events, facilities and also overlooks the fitness industry. We're going to have a really enjoyable conversation and I know that Tech Yin has got some great people online with him from the Sport Singapore team. If you have any questions Questions about Sports Singapore, please do list them in the chat box and we can get stuck straight in. Tig Yin, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, we've got a few topics to get through today, but first what I thought I'd, we'd address is sports because there has been such an upheaval in the sports marketplace when it comes to sporting facilities, sporting events, reopening and closing. What are your thoughts and reflections on what's happening across the world and what are you taking from that about the future of sports in Singapore? Well, thank you for having me back, Ross. Um, I think what's become very apparent to all the rights holders is that every country has a slightly different context. The context is situated with politics, the economic contribution of sport, the social settings in which uh, the people uh, can accept or not accept certain conditions. And everybody then is trying to adapt and adjust Right. We've already gone through a, a whole year plus of seeing uh, athletes performing in front of empty stadia. And uh, in those situations, and even in Singapore's context, it's, it's seen as something that uh, we want to do, we want to carry on doing. Um, but obviously, if you're not driven by uh, huge broadcast deals, um, some of that will be very difficult to carry. Yeah. Right. I think mean, what's common across the board is that everybody is learning what it means to develop a strong SOPs around safe management protocols, yeah. uh, how do you engage in pre-event testing and the like. But uh, the fact remains that um, sports events uh, and venues that will be able to tap off a huge or important broadcast deal uh, will eventually uh, be able to carry on. Um, but I think there are also opportunities as we begin to, to, to look at how interconnected we are in the world for us to be starting to think about uh, conversations that we have across countries. You know, when we, when we looked at the ATP 250 this year, it was obviously an opportunity for us to stage that tennis event a bit at short notice, simply because there was consideration of the athletes first going into Australia and how the safe management protocols that would be uh, in place for the Australian Open would then have knock-on benefits to the way that we would be able to manage the event. So when we think about what's coming up in the future with the Hong Kong Sevens and the Singapore Sevens, I think it's high time that we, as, as host cities, start talking to one another, knowing that what happens in one city will have an impact on the other, and what does that then portend for areas of collaboration, for cross-marketing, and being able to find win-win solutions as opposed to being competing cities uh, for a series? And I think that's something that's coming out more and more, uh, and, and we should be looking at such opportunities. Obviously, uh, continuing investment in fan engagement technology, looking at data, going online, all those things uh, will continue and we will see more innovation in that space. Um, but I think um, if there's a, there's a single message I would like to put out there, I think rights holders as well need to ask themselves what they can bring to the table for host venues and host cities in a way that allows everybody to manage their risks uh, adequately. Yeah. Now, we've got the Olympics coming up this year, of course, and, and well, Hopefully that will go ahead, but who knows in the next couple of months. We have the Sea Games also coming up. These are big, big projects, and you've undertaken these projects in the past. So from an organizer, from a participant viewpoint, you understand what goes into such um, games. What do you think we're going to see differently in the 2021 Olympics and the 2021 Sea Games that perhaps we wouldn't have thought of before? Well, obviously, the, the risk management approach uh, for the Olympic Games will be very different, and that will lead to different outcomes. Um, the, you know, the, the 
games like the Olympic Games hold on to very strong principles, whether it's the principles of not making vaccination compulsory, uh, that will have ramifications in the entire risk management approach for the whole city and for the games organizers in particular. And so you're likely to continue to see a lot of uh, testing, tracing, uh, ring fencing. And what that may well mean is that whoever is going to show up for the competition may not be the best of the best, but the best who can be available at okay. that particular event at that time. I think what's important for people to take away from this is that the spirit and the will to carry on is ultimately what the Games is all about, going back to the roots of the Olympic Games. No doubt in my mind, the Olympics has huge commercial uh, obligations and contracts to want to be able to carry on. Uh, you've correctly pointed out that the situation today and the latest polls coming out of Tokyo make it very difficult yeah. for the whole city to want to carry that out. But I feel that if we're able to um, make those adjustments, adjust our expectations and cheer on what the Games is really about, uh, then we will have a, a very special Olympic Games. Uh, the same can be said for the Southeast Asia Games, not driven by the same commercial obligations, not driven by the same business model. I hope, while it is still months out, uh, that we will have the will to come together. Whether we come together in a single host city, whether the Games is distributed across different Southeast Asian countries, um, we'll have to wait and see. I think uh, I, I don't contribute to the conversation about what the Sea Games Federation is planning. But from a Sports Singapore point of view, we stand ready, uh, if able, to host some of these Southeast Asian competitions, if need be, at the end of the year. Let's look at the athletes. I mean, they've been incredibly hard hit over this past 12 to 15 months. They have lost the opportunity to compete in major games. They have lost the opportunity to train at their highest level at times. How does someone like Sports Singapore, or even how does the industry as a whole, how can we manage to support athletes through this process to make sure that when the competition opportunities do arise, they can take them and that they are the best for them? You know, athletes are, are trained to um, control what they can control, or to pay attention to controlling what they can control. And obviously, throughout last year and early this year as well, they have been adapting uh, with the support of the coaches and the administrators um, in whatever circumstance they find themselves in. I think coaches and administrators need to, to be able to understand um, the needs of the athlete, particularly in this, uh, at this time from a mental health point of view, uh, from the emotional roller coaster that they'll be going in when they look at how all their prioritization plans are, are thrown into disarray and to support them on that front. But this is where, as well, I think stories of athlete resilience, tenacity, uh, the will to continue to fight and carry on, make them such icons for all of us. So I think we, we continue to support them financially, we continue to provide safe environments for them to carry on. But if they are returning from overseas and they need to be quarantined, well, we adapt. We've moved table tennis tables into rooms. We've created all manner of platforms for them to train at home in quarantine facilities, and we'll continue to do so. But again, um, you know, the reason why we invest in our athletes is because they're such an inspiration uh, to everybody. And I think all of us can take a leaf out of what it really means to take control of your own pathway and your own journey. And I think athletes show us that they can do that, and all of us can as well. Let's look at events. Of course, we've got some incredible events in the Singapore's calendar, one of which, of course, is the, is the Singapore Marathon. Everyone loves to see it. In 2020, we had an, a virtual race, uh, and it was very well received. What are your thoughts in terms of how these races, how these competitions can be held virtually? Obviously, it's something that needs to be done. Um, will virtual play a component in the long-term future of races and competitions, do you believe? Well, virtual events and races uh, allow you to reach beyond your borders. 
right? And I think the Standard Chartered Singapore Marathon made use of that opportunity to reach out to an international audience through the Ironman brand. And I think that's a, a very important idea that when we know we have a value proposition that can reach new target segments, it forces us to think about how those new segments might manifest in our engagement throughout the year. Um, obviously, there will be many athletes, many participants who hark back to yearn for the old model. But even if we are able to run a mass participation event live, I think most organizers today will try and see whether the platforms that they've developed for the virtual blended activity can be extended, can be monetized, and present an opportunity to look at new segments. I had a conversation recently with one such company uh, that had pivoted last year and had worked with another technology company to develop that platform. And now they're looking at this as a low-cost model to reach out to new segments, a corporate segment. Yeah. Somebody who's interested in being able to run uh, a month-long or year-long event for their staff as part of their wellness proposition. And everything that we've talked about in terms of races, gamification, leaderboards, I mean, all those things come into play. And anything that, that can possibly lead to a subscription model for something like that, I think has a lot of promise. So I think all event uh, rights holders and organizers would do well to look at this as a, a way to expand the brand, expand the, the target segments, and I think it's here to stay. Absolutely, and I think that's got great potential for ensuring more people are happier and healthier, and that is absolutely that is the end goal for all of us. Let's look at perhaps you know looking at investment trends, investment plans, tech in. Um, it's going to be interesting to see where governments are now going to be investing in the future of their sporting industries, in the future of their fitness industries. What do you think governments are now thinking about as they are? contemplating how to put investment into new channels, into new areas going forward? Well, Ross, even before COVID-19, um, we were part of a, a um, uh, study that brought several cities together, uh, active citizens worldwide. We had Auckland, London, Stockholm uh, sitting together with us, looking at what we were really trying to achieve. and, and Without exception, everybody's looking at participation. How do I get my citizens and, and my, my, my residents more active? And the primary motivation is health and well-being. I think all countries, all cities recognize the health burden that now plagues us with lifestyles that we live. I think that WHO just recently yesterday in the news said, uh, you know, the 50-hour work week is, is driving poor health. And so when we think about uh, investing for the future, sport is a vehicle that helps sustain the social aspects, that reinforces sustained participation. The fitness industry recognizes that already. You know, it's, it's not quite defined as sport, but at the same time, the way we organize our venues, the way we organize our programs are all around the social dimensions of, of physical activity all for the purpose of encouraging more participation and sustaining that participation. I think we, we are looking at a future where the health sector, the health industry, the medical sector, and the sport and fitness center, uh, 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 sector are going to find that nexus, to find the way to build a bridge because healthcare costs are just not sustainable. And this is right now a, a big area of conversation. And for Singapore, for sure, and I'm sure our partners that we've met with overseas are looking at the same. Right? We have got to be able to translate uh, everything that we know into mass participation. And by that, and I, and I take a, a leaf out of what Jason was saying earlier on with TheraBody, uh, how do you reach the, the, the taxi drivers? How do you reach the... the the man in the street, yeah. right? And I think our investment will be geared towards working with industry toward that end. Let's look at innovation because, of course, the, we've seen so much innovation happening on so many different fronts in the last 12 months, um, Techian, whether it's been sport tech and fan engagement tech, 
whether it's been fitness tech or wellness tech, coming back to this nexus of everything coming into the same holistic area, where do you think we can actually apply new innovation? How can we encourage innovation across industry, across government to put new ideas, to put new concepts, new capital into high potential areas? What can we do? What can government do? Well, you know, um, webinars like this one are obviously a, a great um, uh, incubator for creativity and getting ideas out there into the marketplace. I think as, as a government statutory body, we are looking at how do we sort of move from ideas then to innovation? And how do we bring different parties together for that purpose? You know, the, the Ministry of Trade and Industry in Singapore has, has sort of worked with the private sector to develop uh, 23 industry transformation maps that account for about 80% of GDP. You will find that sport and fitness is somehow embedded, whether it's embedded in retail, whether it's embedded in health, it's not explicit. And I think we would have to be able to find that connections into these industry transformation maps, ensure that everybody who plays in the sport and fitness and wellness industries understand what government grants are available to them. We have, as Sports Singapore, put out our own grants for innovation. Yeah. We've put out our own grants to encourage uh, people to step forward to, to sort of connect with each other. We've brought in the, the Global Sport Innovation Centre and we'll be looking to work like, with partners like yourselves to continue to provide that network, but perhaps think about what other value-added support and services we could put there for industry. You know, today we have a webinar. Uh, tomorrow, um, we might have Shark Tank or Dragon's Den for wellness. Who knows? But I think for Singapore in particular, given the small market, domestic market that we have, going regional is going to be very important. And so the opportunity to encourage and build international partnerships that provide access into regional and global markets is something that we can work on together. 100% agree with that statement, ladies and gentlemen. It's so important that we work with our government partners to unlock the future of health, fitness and wellness. We can't do it together. So we can't do it alone. We really have to do it together. Tegin, you touched on this earlier, the idea of smart cities, this idea of us embracing and adopting technology. It's going to be so important for us to make sure that we're using technology to engage and to make sure the rest of that population is active. Is the future technology centric or is it still very much humanity centric? It will always be um, humanity centric, but enabled by new technology. Um, technology in the form of networks, technology in the data that provides, um, you know, the, the when, when I spoke at, at FIT Summit, um, I think three editions ago perhaps, mm -hmm. we spoke about a transformation in three domains. Right? You have a transformation in platforms. So whether you're looking at platforms like apps, whether you're looking at platforms like physical bricks and mortar, um, there needs to be a, a transformation in the way knowledge and experience are tied together. Right? And, and that's, that's certainly where we have a long way to go. You can walk into a gym today, but not know what to do. And whether or not you are getting the best out of your time, I think Jason has sort of alluded to that, um, is questionable. And so the opportunity to transform platforms and how different parties come together to ensure that knowledge and experience are tied together, that's a very important piece. The second one of the, then, of course, is how we look at cities and how systems across cities uh, can be sort of stitched together so that we can reach the masses, right? It should not be a single business trying to think about how to reach taxi drivers. Yeah. 
that product or that service is available but needs to be stitched together in a larger system, whether it's insurance systems, whether it's systems tied in with the unions. Yeah. These are all things that we need to be able to, to think about. But ultimately, we require transformation in the way that individuals own their health and wellness experience. And therefore, starting to work with the medical community is an important starting point to be able to build that bridge between treatment to preventive health. So we have people on the right-hand side who are very active, who are not necessarily healthy and well because of other lifestyle habits, but we can take their participation and move them forward. There are people on the side who are chronically unwell, who we can slowly move across with partnership and the systems that we create. And then there's a whole lot of people in the middle who are either going to veer left or right. And this, these are the systems that we build the platforms that we have, but how do we bring about a transformation in the way that people are willing to own this? Uh, at Sports Singapore, we're looking very carefully at what it means to be able to provide a coach-enabled uh, system uh, and how you would bring that to scale. And I think the sport and fitness industry has a lot of capacity today that is as, as yet untapped. And so that's something that we have to do. Um, so, you know, I think the future for sport and fitness is bright across Singapore, the region, the world, because it's how we are built. It's how we are humanly <laughs> designed. Well, I think it's very interesting to see, I mean, Singapore has been a champion of health promotion. It has the health promotion board you, the Health Promotion Board, People's Association, really are working in tandem to try and get that grassroots movement activity going on. Uh, it's fantastic to see that. And I think one of the really interesting things we'll see, ladies and gentlemen, in the next couple of quarters, next couple of years, is how governments become much more health promotion as opposed to safety promotion. I think that is an incredibly exciting part. And we already see Singapore um, already committing and investing to that for a number of years. So great to see that tick in. Let's look at Singapore as a whole now. Um, this is it's home for myself, it's home for Tech Yin, it's home for so many other people here. It's become very much a hub for business. It's a hub now for fitness, wellness, and sports. It's got some incredible events. What's next for Singapore as the hub in Asia for sports, fitness, and wellness? Well, you know, Singapore's position as, as a global city is something that um, our leaders would say is an imperative. We want to attract um, global talent who want to make Singapore the, the place where they live, work and play and to use all our human capital to uplift standards of living for all Singaporeans. And I think sport and physical fitness has been part of that agenda since day one. Increasingly, as the country has developed and prospered, we've been able to offer more in, the, in, in terms of events and, and you know, uh, world-class entertainment. And I think the quality of experiences that we bring from sport and fitness and wellness has been improving over the years. I think as we begin to, to um, charge ahead, being able to continue to make improvements in the quality of experiences and how that relates to two very important national agenda, namely health and sustainability, is something that the whole industry and government will have to work together to look at. Um, the social determinants of health and sustainability agendas are something that sport and fitness can certainly work on to have knock-on effects to many other segments and sectors in Singapore. And I think that's where the relevance is to be, is to be celebrated and the narrative to be grown. And I think, therefore, we can only see sport and physical fitness becoming more and more important in our society in Singapore and how that then becomes uh, an attractor for international business. I think um, many people can imagine and we have to join the dots to enable that to happen. 
One closing question, ladies and gentlemen. Tekian, um, as I mentioned to Jason just in the last interview there, people can choose to look at this pandemic a number of ways, but we're trying to look optimistically, positively ahead. What positive, optimistic outlooks, perspectives, learnings are you taking from the last 12 months? Well, I think um, we all acknowledge um, how disrupted we all feel. But with disruption comes creativity and innovation. With disruption comes a new realization and valuation for health and well-being. I think that is a lot of promise for the type of work that we do. What we need to be able to then do is to recognize that we have to embrace the DNA of being agile, adaptable, resilient, and to bring what we know to the table to continue to develop that in our own entities, as well as to spread that across the customers and the people that we serve. So I would say that my main takeaway is that there is a new normal that we will all live in, but we are resilient, and that resiliency has shown through in the year, and in, and I think continues to shine through. Um, so I'm optimistic about how we will respond as a country. I'm optimistic as to how we will respond as an industry. And I think the ideas and the innovation that will come out of this will be valuable to be exported. Agree. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, very much enjoyed that. Take in. Thank you very much for coming in today and being with us. Um, we're very proud to be a partner of, with Sports Singapore. They've been championing us from the very start of our endeavours here, and long may that relationship continue. Take in. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll break this interview off, and if you want to skip into the next session, I'll be joined by the one and only Greg Oliver in about 60 seconds' time. <laughs>